How many have actually used it? Okay, some experts here. How many, um, well, how many like it? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting. It's an interesting um, piece of work. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, the first thing is let's uh, let's go let's go back a little bit. So if you're not using basil, and I'll say it either basil or basil. I think it depends on where you're from, but uh, I'll just call it basil. Um, what are you using to build your your services today? Make, go. Make files. Make files. Go. Just go. Go build. Docker. That's it. Docker. So what what on top of that? Just a make file on Docker, or just a shell script, or yeah, using bamboo to deploy, okay. yeah, deploy ECS. Um, what do you guys use here? I have to answer. Yeah, do you know? Kafka. I mean, we use Jenkins to sure. the CI CD, sure. but it just executes go build. Okay. Yeah, mostly make files and go build. Yeah. Okay. I think most people are doing that. I mean, um, you'll see that I do make files of those things to uh, to facilitate. Building with even with basil, um, but it's kind of interesting as to why one would even choose or even look at this one. Um, I think it's interesting as always when you're dealing with build tools. There's always this notion of do you want it fast or do you want it correct. Now, what I'm what I mean by that is you don't want your build system to be you know, take forever. I remember a long time ago where. Builds usually used to take hours. You know, in the old time, they used to take hours. Um, and even now, if it's like it's under you know, a couple minutes and, or uh, over two minutes or something like that, I'm thinking, man, what's going on? It's just too slow. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is, is the reason why I, I, I denote the, the correct is when you think about building software, the biggest thing that people forget is that at some point you're going to have to bit for bit reproduce what you built at some point. Especially if you're doing things with um, with cu large customers or whatever, and they have various versions out there, you need to debug, you need to figure out what's going on. You have to be able to reproduce that binary bit for bit. And so how do you do that when you install stuff on your machine, and the different versions of the compiler, or this, and, and, and you just kind of drift as far as your, as your, as your, as well as your, as far as your tools go. Now, I don't, if you, how many have gotten into that situation where you're trying to build something a couple of years later, and it either it doesn't build or you, when you build it, it's kind of like changed on you. So one of the nice things about it is that Basil gives you both, meaning this, this it's very, very fast, and it also provides this correctness. We'll talk about kind of how it does that. Um, so first of all, what is Basil? So it comes, um, a lot of the stuff that we have in the cloud, a lot of stuff we have that's great, comes out of research, or comes out of Google Land, right? As well as Microsoft and other places. But Google really has this notion of what does it mean to build big stuff uh, and do it well. And so Basil actually came out of Google Land and uh, it uh, was derived, so, so internally they have a system called Blaze. Of course, they always have to, change things around when they open source it, right? Um, so they had a, a tool called Blaze, and what they did with Blaze is, um, as you can imagine, they created a, a, an environment that they can build their billions of lines of code, billions of lines of code, and they did it in an environment so that it can be reproducible, such as a, it's a sandbox environment. It's not, there's no sort of being correct. Um, now, what we're going to talk about a little bit later is how do you do that with a source control system? Um, and of course, they have to write their own in order for them to do the, that bit at scale. So we'll talk about kind of what uh, kind of the limitations that you have when you start using Git at a higher scale. And I don't, I don't mean to pretend, but I don't think there really, really are anybody here that's going to run into those problems yet. Um, it's usually when you're at the hundreds of thousands of files um, and <coughs> tens of thousands of revisions and that type of thing. Um, the interesting thing about this environment, meaning Basil, uh, and they, that was in 2015, 
and uh, then Facebook, and then I think, uh, who is it, the other one? Um, LinkedIn. Anyways, they, they kind of took the, the, the Google stuff and they kind of made their own versions. So there's some other ones out there that are very similar to, to, to Bazel. But what's interesting about it is that it's, it's, it can support any language. So it's not something that you just build, it's a built tool for just go. It's a, you can build Java, you can build TypeScript, JavaScript, um, Rust, Python. I mean, you name it, you can build uh, using uh, uh, Basil. And the interesting way that they did it is they created this, this, this own, their own language. Of course, this is Google, right? They created their own language called Starlight, uh, St Starlark, and it's kind of a Python-ish environment, okay? And in that environment, uh, you can create these extensions to, to use any type of language you'd want to, uh, to in the system. Um, and as I said, the, the current, even, even Bazel will support hundreds of thousands of problems. So, I don't know, what's the size of ProBases you guys work with? Hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of files? We count repos. <laughs> okay, so, 285, <laughs> 285 repos, a right. couple thousand apiece. So you're, you're still in the tens of thousands. Yeah. Anybody bigger than that as far as code base? No million lines of code or a million. You're probably a couple a million almost lines of code. Right. Um, the interesting thing about it too is is this notion of the quickness. You know, I talk about quick. Um, we'll get into this a little bit, but Literally, they can build their billion lines of code in, I, I don't know, I'd actually have to ask a friend how long it really takes, but it's, it's in minutes. It's, it's within minutes. Um, and I'll kind of explain the, the architecture as to how they, they do that. But they can do it again because one, they have their own version of a source control system. And two, they, they have just the knowledge to do it. Um, What's interesting is how, how it becomes so fast is Bazel creates this dependency tree of your source code. And then it, it caches that. And each of these, these, these uh, nodes in the dependency is cached so that you can, when you come back and you say you want to rebuild something, it already knows what needs to be built and what does not need to be built. Um, and also they, they actually do that with their tests. So it's actually not just for building code, the test actually can be, when you run a test or a slew of tests, it'll already know that you've already run and passed those. So it doesn't need to go through them again. And that's really kind of a pretty cool thing because both your build and your verification and your tests can be very, very fast. Now, the interesting thing is, now how do they make it correct? Okay, so as I, as I noted before, they, they have this notion of a sandbox. And so what, what happens is that we'll talk about kind of the, the constructs, but there's a way that you can declare in each of these areas of, of, your, of your source code, the, the dependencies, the source, what constructs the actual code. And then every step that happens in, in Bazel is it happens within a sandboxed area. Now it's not a VM um, and there's some question of how much it could leak you know, as far as in the environment, but, but really it is a very good sandbox environment without getting into the VM world, okay? And uh, I'll explain kind of how that happens. And then what's nice about it is that each time you do that build, it is exactly the same, state machine, same way of doing it, same type of tools, very declarative in its nature. And so it really, really, you can re reproduce bit for bit the code that you have, uh, you want to build. Now, how does it do it? Well, basically what it's doing is it's, um, as I mentioned, it creates a sandbox. And when I'm saying the sandbox, it'll, it, um, it creates these links inside of your, your workspace, as they call it. And in that workspace, then it'll actually bring in the, your, your source code into that sandbox environment. It then brings in any of the tools that it needs inside of that pipeline. So your, your compilers, anything like that. And then it knows how to do the dependencies, injects the dependencies within the sandbox, and then ultimately then it, it creates this build output. Now what's interesting also is that it understands 
how to be cross-plat as well. I mean, if, you're, if your compilers are cross-plat like Go, right, it knows how to create your various binaries by specifying Darwin, Linux, Windows, whatever, and it can do all of that at the same time. Um, and so it pr produces this again in these in these kind of this build output in these sandbox environment. So it's it's quite interesting when it does that. So now the question is, where do you begin if you want to get into Bazel? Where would you start? <coughs> where do you think? Get installed, right? Um, so for Mac, uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. So this is the disclaimer because I know people. This is a Go meetup, and I wish it were written in Go. It is not. Great job. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> it's not. Um, but, but there's some there's some talk. They said it was fast. Those don't come. <laughs> That's what I, I know. Went through the cover and said, "How can they do that?" And it's very interesting what they're doing. Okay. Very interesting what they're doing. But this uh, this shell is basically creating the GRE, bringing the great GRE, GRE, and, and you know bundling it all into one area. And so it's just a binary that ultimately that you that you uh, execute. And it'll just be Basil, but underneath it really is it is Java, and it's amazingly quick. So how many terabytes of RAM do you need to run it? You need your own computer just for the no, no. Yes. Um, it's not too bad. But I'll tell you the reason why how it's fast is what they're doing is they're creating a server underneath. So there's a there's a server that gets launched the first time you you, you run Basil. So it creates this this daemon, if you will, this server in the back end. And it'll actually, there's some default values, but you can actually uh, specify whether you keep that server up all the time, or it actually, the default says, I think it's like three hours or an hour, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it'll actually then just go away. So the next time you need it, then it'll just come back up and it'll be slower that, that first time that the server needs to come back up. Um, but then afterwards, the server's there, it already knows about the dependency tree, and then is off it goes. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I haven't checked to see what, the memory is on that server, but it seems pretty light. It's not too bad. It's Java. <laughs> um, if you have other environments, Windows, Linux, then go here to those releases. They also have the mechanisms by which they have installers and such. Now, I just want to talk about kind of the terminology. I kind of flung some terminologies as I've gone, terms, as I've, uh, gone along, but <laughs> let's talk about what a workspace is. <clears throat> this is the, the big construct of, of, of Basil is this notion of a workspace. And all the workspace is is this is the, really the top level directory of the source code that you want to build. Okay. Now here's where I can take a little bit of a side note or a side journey and say, how many believe in and or use a what am I gonna say? Monorepo. Monorepo. <laughs> so who uses a monorepo? Okay, not too many. Um, the same monorepo. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. The same monorepo means, yeah. okay, that's good. Um, what's interesting about this debate, and it's been a debate for a long time, is um, how does it actually work? How can it work? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, the reason I bring it up here is that if you're talking about a large set of services that you want to build, your workspace space would include that whole structure. Now you don't have to have a mono repo for Bazel. This can be you know, in its own area. I'm going to demo just one little directory that just has it. But I'll also show you our directory structure and how we actually uh, use a mono repo to build our components. But there's some pluses and there's some minuses in doing that. Now, as for those that are using mono repos and get it to work, what are the things that you like about it? Sorry, with the pizza in there. Or if you have somebody else. You do cross-cutting like package and library changes and a single atomic commit. Okay, so I'm going to just poke a little bit. So um, when you when you're doing gRPC, what's the problems that you have with uh, with not having a mono repo? I think it just works. <laughs> That's a lie. That's a lie. Okay, it can work after a lot of work, right? But what happens? Somebody gets out of date. You duplicate your code. Wow. You, you have to duplicate them. Everything is kind of weird at some point, um, and it gets very interesting at times. So talking about that bit for bit, and knowing about dependency changes, reacting to those dependency changes, it really gets interesting when you're getting with your protofiles. Can be done, but that's one thing about the monorepo that it does provide. 
Uh, Google, um, Facebook, I mean, there's just a bunch of them that use this model repo uh, philosophy. The gotcha is they have good tools too. Um, as I say, when you get into the higher end of, you know, millions of, millions of files up to billions of files, you have to worry about your, your source control system. How you bring everything down or not bring it all down, your, your shadow file system, some people a Swedish environment file system. Um, and Google, they have some other interesting things they do in, internally. Uh, but I think the scale that we are in, it still works fine with Git, a mono repo. Um, one thing that I do find in a mono repo that's interesting for developers is um, one, it's for those that haven't done it, it's kind of a, a pain because. You can't change stuff without affecting somebody, which is really nice because as a team, it's nice to know that if you change something that you affect somebody and you know what happens. And you know right away that if you messed up, it doesn't work, right? And so there's a kind of a nice thing about that when, when you deal with a monorepo. Now, um, I'm not saying that it is the end all that you should do it. Um, there's some really good things about it, but there's some nuances that in order to get it to work, I don't know about you, but there's some things you have to do to, there's some upfront cost, let me just put it that way. But let's get back to this. A workspace really is just that, that top directory where your, your source files are gonna be. The next notion is this, this notion of packages. Now don't be thinking Java and all other garbage. Please. All right, one last question on workspace. Does workspace have to be one-to-one -to, -one to a Git repo? Um, or could I put multiple Git repos into it? <coughs> you could do, you could, okay. you could. That's where it gets when the it kind of this world of source control systems, the, the scaffolding around what you're doing there. Um, so I could get a dependency tree theoretically cross <coughs> repo. Sure. It doesn't know anything about Git. It doesn't know anything about your source. It's, as long as the files are there, somehow you've got them there, <coughs> you'll then deal with them after the fact. So then you could get, the, you'd have the same benefit if you change something, even if it wasn't a mono repo, you could still know pretty immediately if it affected it. Other Correct. Okay. Correct. And uh, the thing that you're using to detect the Git, you know, changes and stuff, you could maybe do some stuff there that actually then notifies and brings automatically down. I mean, you could do some stuff there. But you could do that. Um, but the issue is, is that once you have a, a workspace, this notion of a, this top directory, then there's these, this, uh, a package really is a, a collection of the related files, data, whatever that kind of makes up this independent node of, of compilation, okay? Um, the next is this notion of you have these targets. You can imagine like in a make file, you have the make, you have the make target, what you're building, the actual library, the actual binary. That is really, um, this target is, is kind of an element of a package that just finds these rules and the various files and the dependencies that are inside of that. And then the label is this the name of the target. And we'll get into kind of what this all means, but when you want to build an individual thing, it's by the label, right? You want to build this component, you can build that, just that component, and you do so by the label. And then uh, these rules, which were inside this, this area, um, really determine kind of the dependencies, what you're trying to build, what the input is, the source files, what's going to be built, the, the, um, the output, um, and pretty interesting as far as how they do that. Now, when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at these packages, if you will, these areas, these directories, every directory that has, that has a package and a, and a target will have a build or a build.basal file. You can, either one of these are, are, can be used. Um, I prefer this one because sometimes there's a build directory some people have and it kind of gets messed up at that point. But um, build.basal build is the same thing. And it, it is a file that contains these dependency relationships and the rules of how you're going to build it. Okay? Um, so, we start out, we've installed Basil, works on our machine, don't have much memory, but there's some that's okay, it's Java, but it's okay, you don't know. The first thing you need to do then is you've got your source code, all the files you know, and then what you do is you create this file called a workspace. 
all caps. So that, that workspace file really is, is the anchor to, de to determine your workspace, okay? And that workspace um, defines kind of the tool you're gonna use, you're gonna use for the building. Now, I talked about uh, multi, uh, you know, polyglot and all that other stuff. This is where you define what elements you are needing, what tools you need to build your, your, your code. So for instance, and I'll show you what the workspace uh, file looks like for Go, but if you wanted to have uh, in a mono repo where you'd have uh, like Node, TypeScript, Java, C, C++, and Go, you define those tool sets in this workspace file. And that's, uh, I'll kind of show you what that Starlock you know, looks like, but you're basically downloading that, the, the definitions of that tool set. And then also, um, what's interesting is, for Go, it kind of understands modules. And I'll show you how to fix that. Um, it's not really there yet, but it works. Go doesn't even know how it works. <laughs> modules yet. Well, so, really I don't know. <laughs> when do we go? Like, 112. It's got it's, something, but it's quite, there's no uniform. All right. Go All right, let's go here. Who's using Go modules? Come on. Not <laughs> at home. Not yeah. at home? I said at work or at home, because I work, no. What, what, do you have, what issues do you have? No, I just, they don't want me to. I use it at home, right? They will, he will not let you. <laughs> no, it's not him. Link is not stopping. It's, it's not me. Let's talk afterwards. Right. So, <laughs> it's not Clint. So what is everyone using then? We use Glide so, basically everywhere. Yeah, so what, what are people using? We use shell scripts. Yeah, go vendor, dev, Glide. Glide is great. Glide. Okay. I'm just right. curious. Anyway, sorry. And, and so so let, me, let me get make sure, make sure you're going to a Why don't you like the one <laughs> today in 112? Still, no. still not sure they aren't going to change things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair, although. The, from 111 to 112, they didn't change much, and at 113, then it's, 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 it's so. There's no but, benefit to doing it. Yeah, there's no benefit in doing it? Yeah. Okay. In a mono repo, we just have it, and it's all committed in the vendor, and it works perfectly every time. All right. I won't go there. I mean, I like <laughs> words for us. Um, I just uh, like it, but there's no, there's no incentive to switch to them. Uh, yeah, it just, it just depends on if you're in that hybrid mode of either mono versus multiples and all that type of stuff. But for those that are using modules, which there's nobody here except myself, maybe, um, there are ways that you can use Bla uh, Bazel to, to facilitate that, okay? So here's, here's this workspace uh, file. Now, as you kind of look at it, it's not too bad. It looks pretty bad, but it's not too bad. And all it's doing is basically showing how to load various things into this sandbox environment. So for instance, um, for, for Go, uh, well actually these first two lines are kind of the, the way of Bazel is using to download stuff. So right here it's HTTP, I can download from HTTP or file itself or a Git repo. This is how I'm gonna grab things, okay? So it's built into kind of tools. Then this is the section where it's specific to go. Whereas I say, I say well, go and grab the um, Bazel, uh, excuse me, the, the rules for go for Bazel, and I download it. Now, and what's interesting here is you can either do it this way or you can do it to a specific get, uh, get you know, version. Um, very much backward compatible, you know. But usually what I do is I go and find this, uh, this rules.go repo, and it'll tell me kind of what the newest one is and what things it, su it supports. So for instance, it's 18.1, brand new, but it supports the 1.12.1 and the 1.11, what are we at, 5? Okay. So the, the modern ones. Once you've downloaded it, then, uh, then these are some things that, another set of things that it needs to invoke. Uh, these are basically registering the go, the, the go tools, the compilers into this area, okay? That's it for the, way, for the uh, workspace file, okay? 
Um, and as I say, go here for the various releases if you want, and either do it this way or can I actually have a specific kit? Okay. Why is why are you getting each QR card twice? Um, at the top, do you really need that second line right under the comment? No. Okay. I'm copying. Okay, sorry, I'm just, you know, the uh, worst thing about scale theory is we need to copy and paste, yeah. right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, so I apologize, yeah. Um, this is not necessary here. Okay. Uh, I just, I, I, I was sure if there was a real reason you know, fix it's immediately right above it. All right, he wants to fix it right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pedantic. No, but I, I appreciate you doing that because I do have a uh, GitHub uh, repo for this stuff okay. if you want. And I'll fix that before I. Please. So from that comment down, you would just duplicate that for every uh, framework or, or uh, language that you're using in that workspace. Yeah, what you do is when you go to Bazel, you can then, there's a whole bunch of languages that are supported. Um, and so you can actually then go to those and see how they're downloaded, whether it's a Git repo, whether it's a the archive there. And they all then have certain things here that are, you know, dependencies, you know, registering their tools, but it's the same type of thing for TypeScript, Java, C, C++, very simple. But this, this is how you load your tool set, please. Um, is this where you'd also put, like, Proto, or if you're using, like, Go static analysis tools? Not, not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Not, not here. This is, this is basically setting up what versions of the compilers, tool sets I'm using. Um, if you're, so the reason I'm hesitating is because let's say I want to use Go format or I want to use Go bad or something like that. Right. And it's not part of this thing. Um, for instance, there's a, there's a repo I think I have on my, my references that uh, somebody, oh, it actually it's a, that company that you're not talking about that I can, but Atlassian, um, that is, uh, they looked that they wanted to use Go, what did I see? What's that other one? The metal linters no longer, right. people don't like it. They revive, I think is the new one that people like. What are we, Creed, what do we use? Rolling CI win. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's that one too, but I think revive is kind of taking over the meta thing. Mm -hmm. So um, Atlassian has created their own set of extensions for the, that, that Go, uh, Go tool set. And you can actually just download it from their Git repo in here. So if you don't have something, either you create your own or you find something that's out there. Okay. All right. So then I, we have this workspace file, right? It finds the tools, code versions and stuff. The elements that I need to build the sandbox. But, but not ProTalk. Fair. Okay. Yes. ProTalk tools, okay. everything like you need to build for the profiles you do in here in that workspace. Yeah. 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 Um, how you invoke it later on is what we'll talk about. But um, yeah, the, the, the tools that you need, everything that you yeah. need would be loaded in the workspace file. So let me, let me, since you brought it up. So um, I kind of work with the proto files and, and, and uh, Bazel. And um, it was interesting. Let me just put it that way. And so I backed off. And the reason why is because we use uh, some of the verification stuff and a bunch of others that you kind of like get from proto tool, you know, a bunch of those for, for your verification. And for certain reasons, it was just not finding certain things. And it was probably new, kind of new when I was doing this, so I probably could fix it now. Um, but then again, from a process perspective, we found out, well, do I really want to regen those protos every time? Or do we want them actually checked in you know, for, for, for kind of establishing a criteria by, if you're gonna change this, there's a, there's a process by which people have to, have to go through, you know, to change that, to verify it. We, let, we like to do the latter. So we actually, <coughs> I have a system that we use that, that have all, I have a Docker file that has all those tools in it. Again, our protos pull from and then check those in. We just gen to make sure that it doesn't diff. Yeah. yeah. So but you but you can generate protos, I mean, out of this as well. It has that as well. Um, so I so now I've got my workspace and now I have these individual packages, meaning these directories that have these source files that have a target I'm trying to build. Right. So what I need is I need to create a build file for that. 
Okay, so each directory that kind of has this, this entity, a library or binary that I want to build, it'll have a build file, okay? And that build file then has <coughs> this, this, it kind of defines the relationships, the source files, you know, the dependencies, all the things that needs to be done, and then specifies, you know, what's to be produced, the output, okay? Um, the problem is, I have to update this all the time, right? I mean, it's like a make file, basically. Anytime I've got a new file or dependencies, I've got to, I've got to you know, fix that. That's a real pain, right? But not for Go people. There's a tool for it. And that's Gazelle. So um, you can imagine that somebody uh, internally to Google or whatever said, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm not going to go in there and change a, a make file to add all this stuff. You can actually generate it on the fly. And that's what this Gazelle tool does. And in fact, um, you'll add that Gazelle tool in the workspace to, to bring it into the environment. And then I'll show you how you can run it. But what it does is it, it can then generate the build files for you on the fly or build out a, a Bazel. You can then update those files as you need them to be updated. And as I mentioned before, it can understand Go modules, but nobody cares, but I do. <laughs> uh, but I'll show you how it works. So if you do care at some point, which I think you should, then um, it'll work with the, the Go modules as well. And it can help these. Okay. So as I say, if I want to use Gazelle, which you do, if you're using Gazelle, I'm going to, this is added to the workspace file we just saw before. I'll load in the Gazelle tool. Um, and then kind of a kind of a just a very cookie cutter type thing. You bring it in here, and then you do the dependencies, whatever it needs to do into that environment. So I just add that to my workspace. Once I've done that, then I can use Gazelle as a tool. And what's interesting also is <coughs> it's actually Bazel understands Gazelle, so it, it, you can use Bazel command to to run uh, Gazelle. That was going to be my question. So you have to make a make file to generate your build file. You don't. You use Bazel to yeah. build your build files for Bazel. Yeah. Got it. And then there's a way that you can then update those when you need to when you do a go mod tidy type stuff. Okay. If you're using modules, but nobody does. So, um, so we have that workspace file. At the top, it kind of gets a little confusing. At the top of your directory, there's a workspace, but you also have a build file. You kind of think, why do I need that at the top level? And basically what it's doing is it's, it's, it's allowing you to define certain things that are available across the whole workspace, okay? And one of those is, is this Gazelle tool. Now, you're, it's kind of like this, you know, wonderful things that uh, Go does sometimes in comments or whatever, you know, all just things magically. Uh, this is doing stuff magically as well. You think this is a comment? It's not a comment, okay? <laughs> It's a, it's, yeah, it's an annotation. Now, metadata. this happens to be a comment. <laughs> yeah, but the other one is not. And you kind of have to kind of read some stuff, figure out what these are, you know. Uh, but the most inter interesting that is, uh, this is saying exclude these directories from the analysis that Gazelle would use. Okay? Uh, in this one, uh, if it found protofiles, it would try to do something from it. And so for, for us, for what we've done, I've disabled that globally because I, we have another way of doing it. If you want to use this for proto things, then you would not put that in. And then this specifies where your, your top import path would be. <coughs> and again, model repo is really cool. And you have that because that's all you care about. Right? And then that's just the actual name of the tool. Does that care about, like, what about custom import paths? <laughs> um, Meaning for Go, so like Go.nozzle.io or Weave.xyz. This would be so for us in the mono world. This would be your top, your top level. So still through GitHub. Yeah. And ignore the. And then as far as getting the other stuff, <coughs> out, it takes care of that for you. Okay. But this is how in your workspace you know how to resolve things within your workspace. Does that make sense? All right. Let's get into a demo. And, and again, with demos, what happens? 
great. Yeah, it was great. It works great. <laughs> it's your Kelsey yeah, high I appreciate your pass, seriously. Um, so let's, uh, I'm sure, let's go into here. I'm sure. Just So what I have here is, um, I just have a, a very simple, like very simple go project, okay? And as you can imagine, um, I don't know, does anyone use the, the standard layout for go pro, uh, projects? The standard that's out there? I don't even know Who what the standard is. is. Yeah. I mean, you mean the five or 10 standards that are out there? Yeah. Anyways. Um, need a new standard. Yeah. Uh, this kind of adopts a little bit of that, but the notion that if you have something that should be under command and you have directories underneath the command, if you have packages that are internal in BPKG and you know, a bunch of stuff. So this is very, it's not getting too <coughs> in that, but all this one has is this, this notion of a whole world, it's actually in French, but um, it just has my source code, my test files, okay? And then um, I just happen to throw in uh, a make file for later on, make things easier for like CICD type stuff. And then an increment version, because we use tags, get tags for versioning. So it just automatically creates the, the version, puts it to the Docker image and all that stuff. So we don't have to worry about version files. And then um, and then I just put my elements down in a Docker, that's where my Docker files are. In the mono repo world, that's not what we do, but I'll show you that later on. But this is just to show you kind of what it's, what it's, uh, what it's doing underneath. Okay, so again, very simple. Um, here's the test case you can imagine. TDD first, right? You start with your test first. Everyone does that, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Somebody does. <laughs> you do right here. Yeah. So uh, you know this. Actually, I'm giving you the wrong one. Uh, don't look at this silly one right here. Uh, but this is the actual file. Um, I'm going to show you not having this this top first first because we want to actually see how Gazelle and other things brings in the dependencies on the fly for us. But um, I was playing too much here. But I'm going to eliminate this line here and then just have just the, the standard hello. Um, but in order to get this thing to work for the, the basal world, let's see, where are we? Um, all I have to do is bring over, or create a workspace file. This is my top directory, so I just need to create that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do my cheat sheet, right? And um, well, first of all, because I like mods, modules, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a go mod Init, right? Give it whatever you know whatever I want, and then it creates my my uh, my go mod. Okay, so I, I love where I'm at right now because I can you know make up my modules. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is just copy basically. Um, well, okay, let's just do the, the normal build, right? So I'm going to go build. Um, it may work. Uh, that's not going to work. Oh, that's because I need the uh, directory out. Uh, copy. Okay, so just a normal thing. D, you know, some silly name, right? Okay. So that's the normal right here. People are using just go build. That's all you do, right? Sure. Pretty easy. And when it gets a little more complicated, then you want to do different things. Um, so then, as I say, let's just bring in the, the um, the, the workspace, oh, and then tests, and oh, you know, you've seen test run, uh, standard things like that. So then I'm just going to copy in um, this file so I don't have to type it in anymore. Uh, I'm just going to copy in to that area of the workspace file. Okay, so now this is what we just talked about before. Is that font big enough for everybody in the back? Again, kind of, a, kind of a template, if you want, for just a Go project. Um, again, uh, do I have the two load? Yeah, yeah, let me get rid of that right now. Um, but uh, let's see, it's this one, right? Yeah. 
and Perry. No, it doesn't. Um, but this is the standard workspace file without proto generation and Docker image creation, because it does that also um, for, for a Go project. Let me just do a little side journey here. Now, it's really cool. Um, they've, what's, what's the project called that uh, Google created? I forgot the name. Kubernetes. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the, in the uh, history of things, Docker and Google and some others, they got in some little tiffs, right? Okay. They're, and CoreOS too. Um, <clears throat> so, Docker was kind of not being friendly as so far as the spec goes for the, for the images. Oh, o OCI? And then OCI came out of it and some other things. Okay. Well, Google has even done what about, kind of beyond that in that you don't need Docker anymore to create Docker images. Mm. Okay. So even in Bazel, you can actually create images, Docker images, without having the Docker engine there. And not having root. That's the big thing that, that Google wanted was not to be able to have to have a daemon that requires <coughs> you know, some root socket privileges. Build that? What was that? Build it? No, it does that, that same thing. Yeah. Um, I think it was a K and I can't remember. But it's part of K native, but it's, but it's, a, it's another project. Yeah, it is another one. Yeah. But what's nice about it, you can actually, within Bazel, again on a server, your <laughs> box that does not have Docker installed on it, you can create the Docker images. And it understands how to pose it. Canico. Yes, Canico. Um, and so it'll, it'll create the Docker image for you. You can push, you can pull, you can do anything you want within Bazel. And there would be some other things you'd load down here in your workspace if you wanted to do that. So this is a side note there. Um, so once I've done that, then uh, the question is, I just need a um, Bazel, a top Bazel file, right? And we'll just put that in here, right? And let's just look at what that did. Um, so failed. Failed. Yeah. <laughs> failed. <laughs> a tilde, not a double back. Oh, it, you know, I just don't do what you want them to do. Um, and again, like I showed before, it's a very simple thing. This build basal file at the top is the same. Make sure that get, that the <coughs> binary or the gazelle tool is, is globally available, okay? So I've just copied those over, kind of some template stuff. Like, that's all I needed to do. And then once I've done that, I can basically do a basal build, okay? Now, what's gonna happen here is, it's because I haven't run this for a bit, it's gonna start up a server <coughs> and figure out how to, to build it, okay? Pretty easy. Um, don't worry about that job. I think it's just... <laughs> so again, it created this basal server daemon. It's running in the background. It's then checked out everything. But the problem is, as you can see, it didn't do anything, right? Because it didn't find any targets. And why? Why? No build files. No build file in the directories that I want to build, right? And that's where Gazelle is all that for us Go people, so that I don't have to worry about making it myself and updating it. And so what I can do then is, oh yeah, okay, so let me let me just kind of go over a little bit. There's, you can, we could go on for quite a bit, but um, yeah, don't worry about that. Oh, sorry. Um, the issue here is you can talk to, uh, like, like the Go build, very much you can do the dot, 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 or as, you, as here it's showing you, but I'm not, there's a reason I'll tell you what it is. But this is, well, when you do slash slash this, this is saying the package and then the target. So you can actually then go to, drill down and just do a target. And the reason why it's not finding it, of course, is there's not a build <laughs> file, a base, you know, build, build, build base. Yeah. Okay. So then how do I get that to generate? Well, as I say, you can then, um, use, um, um, so you do a go mod tidy because we do love, we do love modules, 
Okay. But we're not anti go models. We just don't. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm alone. I'm, I'm still alone. So I'm going to. He is. He's dying on this. I'm going to feel you know, like I'm, I'm okay but by myself. I might go. Um, but as you can imagine, what it did was it created the necessary you know, dependencies that I needed to bring it down. Okay. So once I've done that, then uh, the reason why I did that is because I want Gazelle then to be able to figure that out, okay? So then I go in here and I just run Gazelle. Now, what is it doing? First time? Littering. <laughs> Downloading all the tools. Now, I, don't want, I don't want to get that negative, okay? Littering. <laughs> it's carefully placing in a strategic manner. Planting. Build files to help build in a fast and correct way. <laughs> and so, but the other thing is that because as it, as it showed you, it's gone now, but it loaded in the sandbox the Go tool set. So if I had other tool sets defined in the workspace file, Java, C, whatever, it would load those as well here. But once it's loaded in that sandbox, unless it's changed, definitions of the workspace is there. I don't have to do anything again. So if I, if I run this thing again, I don't need to. You see how fast that went, right? Everything's already there and knows what it needs to do and off it goes, okay? Now, it did litter some things. Um, and what it did was it created these directories, which are symbolic directories. This is your sandbox. Inside of here is your sandbox, okay? And um, and so if you get rid of those, you, you have to regen, you meaning Basil would say, I don't know where they are, they have to reload the stuff down again and all that type of stuff. So once we've done that, then, um, well, let me do this one thing. So this this little, <coughs> this little uh, <coughs> helper, now, I'm not gonna say anything, but if you were using the module, um, this is how, you could use Gazelle to, once you've done a Go Mod Tidy that's got all the dependencies, all you know, versions and stuff, this is then how you could then update your build files based on what's inside your Go.mod. So it kind of knows about modules, but not really. But it's nice that this, this is how we use it so that, you know, you're going to do a Go Mod Tidy anyways with modules. And so then after that, then you just uh, use this to update your, your, your build file. So, so what did it do? Um, For those of us not doing that, does it understand other tools, or yes. does it just look in vendor? Uh, or well, what was that? Or to adapt the yeah. lock. Yeah, it's actually quite good, and it can actually create your vendor file, your vendor directory. You can do all that type of stuff as well. So the update repo is is useful too. There's just that nuance that if you have that go.mod, it can then use both sides of, of, of the equation of, of go module support tool, tool chain as well as the other. All right, so once I've done that, then um, I've come down, been down in here and it created this basil.basil file automatically for us. Okay. Now this is kind of, you kind of have to understand these build files, just like you do with make files. And so what it's doing is it's, it's saying, um, it's defining, remember these targets and the dependencies relationships? That's what it's doing here, is it, it's defining, uh, for instance, oh, it doesn't really show it, but in this one it's saying, here's here are my source files. So it would, it would go down in, in all my directories underneath, right? If, if this were my top level target, you would grab all the, the, the files that are make up the source and, um, this visibility, we can talk about it, but this is how you can kind of isolate certain elements of your, of your source tree from some other, some other areas. Most often inside of this package, they'll be private, outside they may be public. And then what you're trying to build. In this case, it, it'll, it'll build this as a library, but you don't know that it's, it actually has main in it. So it also understands that now this is the target binary and it called it command just because of the, the Okay. It also found out my tests. So then once I've got my tests, it understands how to do all that. So then, once I've got that done, you're going to go, Paul, why am I doing all this for a simple file? Well, we'll talk about it. 
Um, but at that point, then I can go back and do this this uh, this simple build. Let me just do a paste. We missed it. Again, it's going to go because it's changed the, the go mod changed some things for me. To, so it's going to go and grab these, right, and, and put those into my sandbox environment, right? Because again, it's outside of my go path, it's outside of it. It's putting that in the sandbox. And once it's done that, then it created, because it's a, a, Dar, a Mac, a Darwin binary. So if I want to do that again, I change something, rebuild it, it would literally take, you know, under seconds to do. And the same thing with the test. If I wanted to do a test um, on here, it, because it hasn't, oops, yeah, because it hasn't run it, don't worry about this one. This is, it actually is really cool. It actually, you can specify to kick off tests if they're too long. In this case, the default is, it's saying, you didn't specify anything, so that must be too large. But <coughs> um, there's a small, medium, large, whatever. This says when the test is gone beyond this amount of time, it'll kill the tests, which is really nice. You mm -hmm. have to worry about that. But then when I do this the next time, if I had multiple tests, it would know that those had already passed and run. The binaries and the, the code hadn't changed, and it would not re redo that test. Now. As I say, you're going to say, this is crazy. Why would you ever do this for simple environment? And the answer is probably not. I mean, I, go build this is fine. Uh, it's only when you get into larger uh, systems or larger code bases, and this is not large at all. Um, but this is our mono repo. And so in here, uh, we don't have very many uh, services right yet. But in here, we have like four services. And inside of those areas, you will have then <coughs> traditional, um, call it, uh, let's go ahead here. Ah. And I don't want to load that actually. Um, you'll just have, you know, your traditional set of what would be considered a, a typical repo, but it's in this big mono world that has the source code, the scripts, everything that's a, a, related to that area. Now, in our world, we do keep things here, such as um, a make file down below, because there may be something that you want to do packaging-wise differently underneath in a model repo. But in general, um, this build file then gets updated by Gazelle in every of the, the bar, any of the, uh, the um, directories. And, um, excuse me, this is build. Oops. <coughs> And this will have then, it automatically understands the dependencies that are necessary. Um, we'll talk about the photos later on. And then what I'm supposed to build out of this thing. Okay. Okay, so um, for larger repos, then what's nice about it, it does build quickly. Um, Hazel, build. And again, it's not going to do quickly now because it's the first time that actually is going to have to go grab everything. So again, even though I had to go in my other sandbox, this is another sandbox, right? So it's bringing down the gold tools because this may not be using 1.12.1, it may be using 1.11 or whatever. It's grabbing the, all the dependencies that have been uh, <coughs> figured out, and then it'll go in and try to grab everything that it needs to to build this thing. So not, not huge, you know, but, you know, 37 targets, Hundred and maybe two hundred packages loaded, a couple of dependencies like that. So then, once it's done all that, this is the first time, grabs them all, and then puts it in the sandbox, and off you go. Once you've had that on your your build box, this cache can be saved, so that then the next time you you build on your CI/CD, it doesn't have to go through all that again. Please. Let's well, say so Darwin sandbox. Um, what would it look like if you were trying to do cross compilation? Would you have different sandboxes for different architectures or? Thank you for asking. So um, <laughs> what you would do is, um, well, I can actually just go over here. 
So what you would do is you would specify um, with inside of the, um, let's see, sorry. In this case, you actually just specify what type of tools and, and the uh, binary, or excuse me, the environment you want. So for in this one, it actually um, specifies that if I'm on, on you know, Darwin on a Mac, it'll then just do the, the natural thing. If I'm on a Mac across platform, uh, then it knows right here that I want to build a target to a, a Linux environment. So in other cases, sometimes you need to have actual like build agents that are on different distros entirely. How would that play into something like Vassal? <coughs> like the hardest, well, so the hardest one is Mac, like or or iPhone. If you have to build those, yeah. either Hackintosh something or you have to actually right. run it on a Mac. Yeah, there there are certain things you would not be able to do just because yeah. in Windows box you're not going to produce an iPhone. That does it have a concept of a build agent, or, or you can kind of kind of does. <laughs> it's interesting too, just on the Mac though, it, it does understand mobile. So it can load mobile and do it. But so how would you do it if you're trying to build for um, Windows, Mac, and Linux? That one you'd have to do a do remote build. You'd have to and, and it has some like rudimentary orchestration? No, it's still, have to, it, there's some. You just have two Basel systems. I have two different environments. Now what's interesting is that you can imagine that uh, in this case, I didn't really get into it because we're getting into a lot of minutia here, but you can specify where this cache can go. And the cache can be on a file system, but there's also a notion that you can have a Bazel cache server. And so it can be, and that's what Google does internally as well. They have a whole bunch of them. They have these, these cache servers to maintain this huge relationship tree, dependency tree. And then when Bazel goes out, you can, you can specify then to, to, to query that to see if there are any dependencies. In this case, um, I, I actually have it local to, I think I have it my temp. I have it specified going to my, my temp directory, and this is actually Bazel that's you know stamping every dependency, every node within that dependency tree with this specific uh, stamp. Oh, I see. Uh, it. that. Do you understand those dependencies? It's so it's clear. clear. It's clear. I mean, I'm glad it's the browser. Right. Are in the computer. <laughs> but there actually is a way that you can actually query the dependencies. So Bazel actually has a query way of querying things. You can actually put it out to a diagram. Um, you can actually see the dependency trees at that point. I think I've gone <coughs> by one minute. Yeah, what does, what is that? Does that go to your last directory, cd hyphen? Yeah. That was the last, it works in git too. That's that's amazing. amazing. Yeah, we learned, that's the best thing I learned. <laughs> 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 He's not presenting next to me. And if he is, don't come. <laughs> you gotta come and do that to me now. Um, pop, Oski, right? Okay, I know that. But I know yeah, check it out too. I learned that this week. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. that. that's cool. Anyways, I'm, I'm glad you learned at least one of the items. Right? And, um, get I learned you use GoMod. That's just the same as Pop. So uh, I think I've given kind of an overview because there's just a lot of stuff that I'm seeing some glazed eyes because you know there's a lot there. Um, it really is an interesting learning curve. But once you get into the actual basic concepts that we just talked about and start playing with it, it really becomes easy. And with tools like Gazelle and others in the Go world, the maintenance of things is just, I mean, it's just it's great. And we just built it in the make file to do those type of things. Well, if I may, it, I don't know, it's outside of Observer. It, look, it reminds me a lot of when I first started doing builds in Docker, except for I'm not wedging like operational things into like the Docker <laughs> image, but it's, it's very much like content cache layer driven stuff, like like a Docker file, except for I don't have to pretend I'm building an image. Right. I can just declare things and do content based stuff. So it's doing it at a higher level, like in the code instead of like. Right, it's, it's more native. Well, it's, yeah. it's very much like that. It is, but the key that's a little bit different is that now you can have that dependency cache outside. Right. And again, what the Docker build process does is allows you even though it's not quite true, it does it in a pretty reproducible way. It, I'm not saying you, I'm saying this is better than Docker in a lot of ways. It, it is. It reminds me of that. People actually yeah. think that by doing a Docker build doc that they're going to get a reproducible binary every time. Not care. And the answer is no. 
depends on how the Docker file has been written. Yes. And so the cache, and when, once you get to a level that you're actually having that state stored somewhere else and it lets you have multiple servers or multiple build builders that can pull from it, like that's a concurrency level thing. Absolutely. If you try to build around Docker, it would be, oh, it'd be yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and again, what's also nice is that that test environment too, it understands the test tree uh, caching as well for the nodes, and, and so it you know facilitates not just the having Docker you're working with images, and it uses an image to create a container that runs. So that image changes or anything. Well, yeah. and people do weird it's things. Actually different than that. So you know we use you know the build a Docker build image to build the binaries, and then you can use then that to put it into a, a scratch you know image. But even in that Docker file, depends upon how you have, how you've written it, you may be getting bits in there that you did not get the last time. Well, that's what I mean, that image is just how, a build, yeah. how you put it together and then. It is, but it, I mean, actually a Docker image is just a tarball. If you were just doing a tarball, every time you're grabbing the tarball, every time and do it that way, you, you have a much better chance of getting bit for bit. Yeah, we, so we use like drone, and drone has that same concept, but you push the image somewhere and then pull it down, and so you're always pulling down that. But again, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can you can get into. Um, I again think that if you're using monorepos, this is a, a great tool to use. I think if you're not, it still is a good tool to help you with getting to be a larger source tree. Um, and as I say, it really gets to be very fast. Um, in a rebuild, I don't know if it. Okay, so you know, rebuild. So see how do it the second time. Yeah. So it already knew if I made any changes or whatever, it would automatically just recompile just those things. And if same. You change something far out in the dependency tree, yeah. it still would have been just as fast. It would. Um, and then again, assuming if you're not polyglot, then you know you wouldn't have to reload those things, but. Here again, don't look at the failed ones. Um, <laughs> see how fast those tests, and I, did I run them before or after? I don't know, but you can imagine that I did run, those probably were cached. And so some, some sort of a, you know, something changed in the source code that I can immediately now very quickly see what has broken rather than wait for a long time for that test. And by change, since it doesn't, so it lets you look at the Go module stuff, but it's basically just doing SHA hash of files in the workspace. Okay. It's a little bit more than yeah. that because the, you know, that's dependency tree. But, it's so, but it, it knows what changes based off of that and then yeah. you explicitly, <laughs> so, so that's where Gazelle is helping you build the dependency <laughs> tree or? Gazelle is a tool to help me build build files. Okay. In a build file, you have the dependency relationship specified. Remember in that source area and that in the dependencies, so if you had the includes, right? Uh, imports, right? They would be specified in there. Um, and it's just updating that for you. So if I did a, a God mod tidy that would, you know, augment those already, then Gazelle would then augment the build file. Please. So in like an actual dev workflow, so you've got, you know, your dev, you're in your branch, you're, you know, commit, commit, commit. Is your last commit always going to be a Gazelle run that updates your build file, assuming you've pulled in? Well, it's interesting you ask that. Because um, what we do basically is we do this. So we do a prepare, a prepare commit type thing. So once you've played around, you've done all this stuff, then just to ensure before you do your commit, it's going to do the tidy, and then the build is actually going to do check do the gazelle automatically for you. And again, this is a make file process that we kind of kind of steps that we kind of adopted. Um, but then you can see what it's doing the update project off the build is just in case. Right, it is running that. Now I don't have to do that every time. I may not choose to do that, but we we now, if you're going to do a commit, you do this, you know, prepare commit first, so that you know that you've updated all of the components you need to. The build so file. So the build file just gets updated with everything. every commit. Any other questions? Please. Completely unrelated. How do you make at Bazel and at Go things? I know the other ones are built like at RM is built in to make. So what's where it's where is at, like basil? Oh, don't look at this. One. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't look at that. Look at that. <laughs> this is a make thing that I don't know, and I'm curious. There are things you can do, but uh, yeah, it, yeah. You're not going to tell me. I'll, I'll look it up later. So, from a CI perspective, 
this means you want a persistent server running, right? Because otherwise, you're, every time it goes up to Circle or CI or Travis, it's going to download, create the sandbox. Like, there's no benefit in a traditional CI system. Yes? I mean, if you're using so law, there's a, there's a benefit because that would be the same problem. Right. What? If you're using Go Mod without a without a cache, which yeah. is like the default way, then this would be a huge benefit to having that state. So, so the question is, is that let's say I have a Jenkins box, and I'm reloading this workspace environment all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I wipe out my workspace, you yeah, know, like meaning a Jenkins circle. workspace, yeah. Yeah. and then, but see, the whole thing is, is where do you put the cache, the Bazel cache? So I put it out on slash temp, or I can put it out on a, on a basal cache server. And so when basal, it'll actually, things are brand, I mean, it's a, like a clean, pristine, you know, workspace for Jenkins. He goes out there and looks at those things and it's just as fast as if, it, if they were there. Okay. So either file system or a server that you keep. And, and actually- you have a server and you'd still keep using Travis? Still good. Mm -hmm. Would you? I mean, mm -hmm. That's a question that you have to, you know, pros and cons. Well, isn't GoMods trying to build the same proxy cache too? Like yeah. they're, they're all finding ways of having yeah. like item and you can see you can see how they're all kind of merging based on a lot of things that Google's been doing internally. Um, the actual interesting thing on this 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 Go, excuse me, the Bazel cache server, all it is 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 really just a simple HTTP server. So it's nothing sophisticated, really. Um, but there's some projects out there that kind of do it all for you, but it's, it's just very simple. Are you hosting inside Kubernetes? What? <coughs> Basil. Basil. Basil cache. Um, so what we do is on our Jenkins box, <laughs> we, we do everything in Docker anyway. So we have a Docker Jenkins image that mounts a slash, a slash temp on the host that then is the cache for the Basil. And the reason why I did that is because sooner or later we may then go to a, you know an outside server, but right now we just don't need that sophistication. But say it, you're not polyglot, let's say you're 100% Go, you're not a mono repo. Go build very fast anyway, and does its own level of caching. Go test? Did you say? It, go. Go test go actually test. does caching too, I think. Yeah. It does. I mean, but again, it may not be as fast. But the question is. What version of Go are you using? Where have that installed? Latest. <laughs> no, it's, it's not great. That's just honest. That's just being honest. Whatever you have installed. <laughs> so the key is, is that not not just polyglot is reproducible, fast builds. And so you could you could just say. So you're saying so making sure that on my local box I'm getting the same type. The same tool sets are the same version as specified in your workspace every time. Yeah. Is that what Docker's for? <laughs> <laughs> but Docker doesn't then give you the other aspects of the caching, the tests. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but and and also the polyglot is not built. Okay, you yeah. Have to you have build a Docker yeah. file image for right. all of my languages, right. which get to be yeah. humongous. Yeah. Yeah. So you still think it's worth it? Or if I wasn't polyglot, polyglot. I'm using Go Mod. Well, so ne Are you next you want to run. Convinced, <laughs> next, next, you want to run. So, you want to run against so, Linux, so right? You want to run your build. I, I, go. This is where I'd say I'd answer it this way: If you have long running builds and long running tests, and you need to have a, an assurity that your tool set is the same for this version as well as the next version, okay. I would highly consider it. <laughs> Well, one of the big advantages of this is that you, you've committed this in, right? And so if you, you were kind of leading up to this earlier, if you a year later need to go back to previous commit, you have the entire build state declared there, not like git go and try to remember what version of go that you downloaded. Like it's right. literally fixed right. everything you need to know about the build, which even more than a Docker file might have. Right? It's, it's, and that's what I'm saying is that if you have these this premise of wanting to do certain things, then I would recommend it. But if if it's not, then you know it's, it's, it's up to you. But I can I can tell you though it's extremely powerful, it's extremely extensible, and in most companies you are polyglot. You're going to have a front end thing. You're going to have something else. You're going to have something that's out there that's going to be 
of a different language. And this does help you with that because how many of you have gone into a, a I, no offense to front end developers, okay, no offense at all, great people. Um, <laughs> Have a big systems guy, systems back end. But you go into the box and let's say you're doing node, and you go NPM or you know yarn and blah, 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 and you go like, wow, that's great. You know, what version are you using? Uh, you know, just do an update and so and you go and somebody else says, you know, let's go, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know, I'm using yarn 112. Wait, wait, it's the one that's out there now. And what what's about your NPM factor? So it kind of works. And then you go, wait a second, what are you using on the build server? Oh, I got something installed on there. I'm sure it works. What well, yarn version? Or what this? And that, you know. So again, you can Dockerize that all, or you can in this polyglot world, you can say front end people. This is your tool set, and back end people. This is your tool set. Now you're going to ask me, what would I do on a day to day at the developer's desk? I probably wouldn't use Basil because they're going to want to use the, their, their IDE tools, you know, the quick reloads and all that type of stuff. But before they get into this world of checking it in for the whole team. And or in this process where you, you know, check it in and then have Jenkins build it at least to see how it works. This will help a lot in that securing of, of, uh, of the versions for you. Does that make sense? So, so you do have Bazel installed in every developer's machine? You certainly can. I'm just saying wow. is, that, is that for front end people, <laughs> typically they don't like having tools outside of their, their IDE set, right? You know, the thing that reloads everything and it's all pretty. Um, and you can do that in Bazel actually. There's an iBasil that, that does that for you. But there's still, when you get a certain tilt, a certain mode, you know, your tool set may be not what you want. But what I'm trying to say is that you'd probably want on your build server a Bazel environment so that you're ensured that your tool versions are the same and that you don't have this, oh, it worked on my box. I don't know, it's not building. So if I paraphrase, you're trying to say the NPM monkeys that will screw you on the versions every time. <laughs> I didn't say it that way. But I did. Awesome. <laughs> I did. <laughs> But you know, Go has had the same problem. Right? That's why the Go modules, you know, everyone has this dependency relationship versioning problem that's been there for a long time. This helps a little bit. You have one more? Mm -hmm. um, you talked about building Docker images in Bazel. How do you do that workflow? It's another target. Where's the build file go? You mean the Docker build? No, the Bazel build to tell it that that's a thing you expect to. So I don't know what I'm putting up here, but um, in, in the workspace file, you you load in the Docker build tools, which are available, and then in your build file in that package area where you want to build that, that Docker image, there would be a target that's specifically to that Docker build tool set, and those targets are build push, pull, all that stuff is right there. And you'd have your Docker file there or somewhere else. Um, Does it need a Docker file? Or can I do it all in, did they try to rewrite that? File. Okay, some of them try to be like, no Docker file, you no, rewrite it. Docker like, file, but it doesn't need the Docker daemon. Build that doesn't use a Docker file, by default. Okay, just curious. Okay, wait, what did you say? Build a? Red Hat's version of a build a, Docker tool. Yeah, they, they, you can read Docker files, but they give you a bunch of commands you run, and you write right. uh, shell scripts. This one, this is just Docker file. They don't want to go you, if, that far out. Have you looked at like settings if you wanted to extend it to use Builda instead of Kaneko? Like, what's the hurdle there? Um, so what we, what we do, um, we actually use Quay yeah, for our really repository good. externally. Yeah. Um, they're a little bit behind on the manifest version. They're like V1, they need to be a V2 manifest of the Docker image format. Mm -hmm. And so you can't push to a Quay. Um, you can push to Docker Hub or some others just because they're just not there yet. But so I was doing that. I was building Docker because it's actually very fast. It's faster to build Docker images in Bazel than it is using Docker build. Just this. Hmm. Um, again, they understand that Bazel, uh, a Docker image is just a toggle. So, sure. but um, so we aren't doing this. We have in the make file, there's you know a Docker build That's process. It. But you could do that if you're on Docker Hub or some other internal repo repository. Yeah, sure. It's um no. It's okay. For some do you use scaffold or any of the like telepresence or or devs to get things running in Kubernetes? Um, not yet. 
I mean, I've looked at telepresence. Squash is another one. Um, there are things that are useful for that. Um, what was that one? I'm just saying, uh, that's right here. Yeah, yeah. The shirt. Um, but we haven't gotten that far yet. In fact, who's doing that today? Are you doing we, much in the we, testing environment in Kubernetes? We do it, but we wrote it. But telepresence and squash, none of those existed. So we have our own entire plumbing yeah. mechanism yeah. to hook IDEs up to a test name. Port forward type thing. Yeah, it's a lot of real magic messing with the services on the Kubernetes yeah. end and creating tunnels and messing with the local. It's so not Telepresence is nice in the sense that it, you can actually have services that kind of if feels like you're there. I like squash too because it's a little more lightweight in the sense that you just you know you're remotely debugging type of stuff. Either one works. Any other questions? Was this helpful? I mean, it's a, it's a very splatter approach to what this tool set is. Um, there's a lot there. Um, get out there, see if it makes sense to you. Um, go ahead, Derek. Let's just, I just don't want anyone else to stick around. If they how long would you expect? You don't expect, you don't offend me if you want to leave, guys. How long would you expect, like, you know, a medium sized repo to get up and running with Basil? Like I'm so assuming I, Gazelle isn't magical and perfect. So I, I'm a, I have a references area. There's a whole bunch in there. One is I do have a GitHub uh, repo out there that has this kind of template in there. You can just grab that workspace, workspace file, that top level base dot, you know, build dot base file, and you can just plop it into your, your directory and off you go after you've installed Basil. And, and make the help chart, right? <laughs> It's not, not that bad. I mean, realistically, like, feels like a day of. So, it, probably so to those that have looked at Basil on their own and kind of got disgusted with it and discouraged, you can it can happen very fast. Um, and the reason why is because I think, um, for me, for my case, is I thought, wait, this is just too complex. This is too hard. What's it doing underneath? So then I kind of went underneath and I go, oh, okay, that makes a little more sense to me. And then when I came back out, it was now I understand more of these, these concepts, kind of the terminology, what needs to be done. And, and especially if you look at how they, when, like our last scene, these others are extending. There's actually a, another project that's using, um, so you can build React uh, components. So you can imagine with Create React workspace or other things, so it's kind of a little beast in itself, right? Well, they've created their own extension to do that. And so um, once you kind of see how they're doing that, and, and it really is not much. These extension, the, the language is Python-ish, right? But when you look at what they're actually doing, it's not that sophisticated. Um, but it, it, they do it in such a uniform way that, that you can be polyglot all over the place. So to answer your question, I think um, probably a day once you've got a start, you know, kind of a kickstart on something like what we have right here. Other than that, um, when you get into the polyglot world, it is, it is weird. That's like React, it just, there's some weird stuff there, but if you're just doing like TypeScript, JavaScript, Java, C, C++, those are pretty straightforward in how to do things. Because as you know, with React, it generates these things elsewhere and packages them up and all that stuff, right? So it can be done. Any other questions? Last one. Oh, you said that before. <laughs> so I feel like Go is kind of tacked on to Basil. Like it's not, you know, front page, it's its own little project, it's a wizard, whatever. Gizelle. Right, but the one of the pro GitHub things, and Gazelle comes from wizard. No, 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 that's my that's, that's, oh. that's his sample oh, project. That's, that's, that's like the, the code oh. in it. <laughs> Go to. Anyway, that's it's like a separate thing from Basil when I looked at it. Well, so the interesting thing is what you're saying is that Basil in itself is it is it is it inherently native to Go? Um, Go does its own dependency tree. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that is is that I I don't know how Blaze was if they did Blaze because of Java and other tool sets that were, didn't have the Go tool set. And then they created that, and then I don't ask a friend, but, uh, and then they just brought go on there because they wanted it uniform. Um, but 
the interesting thing about the extensions is everything's an extension. So even if you don't see it in the in the core, it's it, you're you're always bringing some of this extension in to, to do what you need to do. So even though it looks like it's separate, it really is coming from Bazel build, meaning the the, re, the repo, the go tool for out there, as well as the TypeScript and the JavaScript and all these other things. So I don't I would not consider Go being a second class citizen too much. Um, <laughs> And the reason I say that is because the Go tool set is it changes so much. So like Go format or Go vet or Go, you know, they may not be in that in the main Go tool set, but for the, the most stuff that you need to do, it is there for you. And that's why the last thing I said, they kind of create some other ones that they want that tool set to be a little more expanded. All right, any questions? Um, again, I'll put the slides out that has a, Reference down at the bottom is a GitHub repository that has these the simple example. And um, let me know if you have any questions.